Welcome to another episode of Gray Matter with Michael Krasny. And in this episode, we're going to focus on the heart. That's uh, that fist-sized organ uh, that pumps your blood throughout your body and is made of muscle and powered by electrical impulses. Think about an extraordinary fact. Your heart pumps approximately 2,000 gallons, that's 7,591 liters of blood through its chambers each day, and it beats over 100,000 times each day to achieve that. And in all the years in radio, uh, I always felt good about bringing medical experts uh, on the airwaves. And so I'm pleased to tell you that today we have a leading cardiologist to talk about your heart, and joining us specifically to talk about cardiac issues and health. Ken Kirshengorn was a practicing cardiologist for many years and an internist for decades, now technically retired but still medically treating people, and he was repeatedly selected as one of America's top doctors. He had a private practice as well as having been affiliated with Suttered Health and many hospitals and serving as clinical professor of cardiology at the University of California in San Francisco. And welcome, Dr. Gershengorn. Thank you, Michael. Good to have you with us. Um, one of the things I enjoyed about doing live radio was talking about uh, breaking news. And I just want to, many of you will be hearing this in the future, but we had the good news today um, that uh, Damar Hamlin, who is a safety for the Buffalo Bills and who went into cardiac arrest and uh, in a game which millions were watching, um, he collapsed on Monday night uh, in that game. And I was going to ask Kent about that, uh, Dr. Gershengorn, to start here. And in fact, the first question we have is from Reno, Nevada, from John Snyder, who says, can you walk us through your thoughts and observations as a cardiologist when you see an extraordinary event such as Damar Hamlin collapsing in Monday night football due to cardiac arrest. And we're going to be prompted to talk about commotio cordis here, which you can enlighten us about. Yes. But Jay wants to know your, your reaction as a cardiologist. Well, I mean, the most remarkable and positive thing about the event was the immediate response of the uh, healthcare personnel on the scene. Uh, and uh, the most important thing in a situation like this is immediate action and making a proper diagnosis and treating it immediately. And uh, this was done in this case. Uh, he was started on uh, uh, CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, immediately. Uh, and uh, this really made a tremendous difference. I was going to say the good news is, and again, this is going to be heard in the future, he's now got a breathing tube he, uh, taken out. He's talking to friends on FaceTime. I mean, this is all really very encouraging. It's what everybody was hoping for. Yes, and this is, uh, this is not surprising under the circumstances. Uh, he's a young, previously healthy man who had a sudden cardiac arrest due presumably to ventricular fibrillation, which is a uh, chaotic rhythm of the heart where the heart cannot maintain its output. Uh, therefore, there's no blood distributed, and no blood means no oxygen, no blood distributed to the brain, the kidneys, and the other organs, including the heart. Uh, and if this isn't uh, corrected and reversed very promptly within a few minutes, uh, that that an, an individual will die. And uh, even if they don't die, uh, many individuals in this circumstance will undergo brain death and will become uh, crippled because of, of uh, lack of brain activity. So the CPR saved them? CPR absolutely saved them. Yeah. yeah. Um, and cardiac death after a blunt chest trauma uh, in something like football it's not necessarily common, but I wonder if they're going to be evaluating. They're talking a lot about concussions in football, but talking about those kind of dangers. More? Yeah. Well, I mean, this is something that actually that has happened in hockey. Uh, it probably it has happened in amateur baseball. I don't know if it's happened in professional baseball. Uh, as far as I know, this has never happened in professional football before. Uh, and the condition, uh, if it is what we think it is, uh, commodio cardis, uh, is where there's blunt trauma in a certain area of the chest, right over the heart, uh, and it is the sudden blunt uh, force to the heart during a certain part of the cardiac cycle. And this is a, a part of the cardiac cycle that's about a fifth of the cardiac cycle, something like 20% of the cardiac cycle or, or less, where the heart is particularly sensitive to any kind of trauma or any kind of electric shock. Uh, and in, if it happens in this particular area with the right timing and the right acceleration and the right force, uh, the heart will go into ventricular fibrillation. And that's presumably what happened here. Uh, before they make that diagnosis, in this case, 
uh, and it probably will be the diagnosis. He'd have, he has to undergo numerous cardiac tests. Uh, but football players, especially professional football players, generally undergo fairly rigorous testing before the season starts, before they're, they're, they're admitted to play professional football. And chances are he has a completely normal heart. And that's the nature of this particular condition, is that it can happen in a particularly, in a, especially normal people, when a particular situation evolves where there's the right amount of trauma at the right time, uh, at the right force, uh, and it's just a, a very unusual circumstance, but it has happened before, and it probably will happen again. Well, it looks positive at this point, though. And like you said, he was a healthy specimen to begin with. So I want to talk about heart health with you and how you can stay healthy and keep your heart healthy. And we hear almost like a catechism, you know, um, you stay away from salt and stay away from uh, trans fats and all these kinds of things. And we're told about the foods that we should eat as opposed to the foods that we shouldn't eat and do exercise and stay away from alcohol and stay away from tobacco. I mean, it's almost like we also hear kind of things that aren't as attached. Maybe talk about the food with you, and we'll probably get some questions along those lines. I want to talk about the things that you hear less stress about, less emphasis on, like stress, less stress on stress, although that's an important part of the equation. The other thing that I keep reading about from all the heart news that I get is get your stress test and, and make sure that you... Uh, get cardio healthy by being sure that you have not only stress tests, but um, uh, they're telling you to, to do the kinds of things that I'm wondering, just I guess I want to ask you how important they are. Um, get your blood pressure checked, we're told, for example. How important is that? Well, that's, that happens to be very important. Uh, the thing about cardiac health, it's really a long game. Uh, you don't uh, you can do terrible damage to yourself in, in, in seconds, as, for example, with, with this case, uh, or um, by um, having some other kind of trauma. Uh, but what, what the, the cardiac health and heart health has to do with the long game, and that is protecting your arteries and protecting your heart muscle uh, over the long term. Uh, we have a life of many, many years, and... Uh, we can get away with certain things certain times. We don't have to always be on a perfectly good diet. But over the long haul, if we watch a good, follow a good diet, if we exercise, uh, if we uh, follow good health habits, whether it's getting enough rest or avoiding uh, emotional stress, physical stress that's, that's detrimental, uh, over the long haul, we'll, we'll do well. But you and, know the old argument, if you've got bad genes, so like Jim Fix, you're going to die anyway, right? Well, that's not true in this day and age, because fortunately, people even with bad heart disease can be treated. So there is a small percentage of people whose genetics are such that they're going to do poorly with almost anything we do. But even in those people, we can significantly prolong their lives and their health by certain kinds of, of treatments and certain kinds of, of uh, diag diagnostic tests that alert us to these problems and help with prevention. But I've been reading some things that, that sort of surprised me, like um, a couple cups of coffee a day actually help uh, in terms of avoiding heart disease, supposedly. Well, you know, there are a lot of little fixes. Uh, they say, well, having, having a drink is good for your heart. Um, alcohol can lower the cholesterol transiently, uh, but that's not the best way to do it by any means because alcohol has other dangers. So you have to be careful what you recommend uh, and a lot of things that we recommend in the short term that may seem to take care of things immediately uh, will don't fix things in the long term. And caffeine is one of these things that is not probably a very dangerous kind of a chemical, but it is a chemical that we don't need. Uh, adding it to our daily diet is probably generally not harmful, uh, but it's not something that we say, well, this is something we should do to improve our health. Uh, if you like caffeine and you feel you need caffeine for whatever reason, fine. Uh, do it in moderation. Uh, but to do things like adding caffeine or, or other drugs that aren't necessary uh, will not in the long run do you benefit. So what's more beneficial? Uh, I mean, you hear a lot of talk about berries, for example. You're going to eat berries or bananas and apples, vegetables and fruits, these kinds of things. That's where a lot of the emphasis is. So when we talk about a healthy heart, we're talking about specific foods like that? For the well, most we're part? talking about a good, healthy diet, basically avoiding saturated fats, fats 
uh, having adequate amounts of protein, uh, carbohydrates, some fat, the right kind of fat, uh, and uh, fruits and vegetables, which help the whole system. Uh, they help your, your digestion. Uh, they help uh, the way things we ab absorb into our body. They, they maintain a good digestive, uh, a good digestive tract, and this, this also helps the system. So these things all go together, and it's a, it's a uh, compendium of many different kinds of approaches that give us a, a, a healthy life and a good life. And where is cholesterol and lipids, where do they fit into all this? Well, I mean, there again, there's, there's a genetic tendency to have elevated cholesterol. And if you have elevated cholesterol uh, with the wrong genetics, you're going to build up plaque in your arteries. Uh, not only your coronary arteries, but the arteries around your kidneys and the arteries around your, your other organ systems. Um, but this can be managed, again, by good diet. And uh, especially if you do have a tendency for this to happen, by medication. And it's very important that we identify those people who, despite good diets necessarily, still need medication. And we're in a situation now where we can uh, significantly alter the uh, amount of hardening of the arteries, of coronary atherosclerosis, we call it, of uh, plaque building up in your arteries. Uh, and this, we, this can be done with medications that are very simple to take uh, and very important. What about statins? We Those, talk, I, mean, I, mean, because, uh, I did a whole program on statins, and uh, I was a little bit uh, concerned at the time about the effect on the memory of statins. We don't really know at this point, do we, about the effect of memory? Well, we know that it has never been shown to be detrimental. Statins have not been shown to be detrimental to the memory. There, there are isolated anecdotes about, about it, but nobody has proven it in the scientific study. But they and, do bring down cholesterol. But they clearly bring down cholesterol, and enough studies have been, have been done now that is... It is uh, a, a definite improvement in the outlook on people who have hardening of the arteries and plaque in their arteries. We had a question from someone in Germany. Stefan wants to know, I lost a close relative through cardiac arrest. Doctors said he had a thicker than usual heart wall because of a genetic disposition. Is this a well-known issue? And how would one treat such an issue to prevent such a case? Well, this is a matter of detection. And... Uh, there is a condition called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which means it's a, uh, a, a, an illness of the heart that's related to a thickening of the heart muscle wall. Uh, and the important thing in this situation is to identify it. And this can be identified, uh, the simplest test to identify it is an EKG, an electrocardiogram. And it's suggested on an electrocardiogram. And further testing will show that there is thickening of the heart muscle. Uh, unfortunately, there is a very small percentage of people who don't know they have this, where it's not picked up uh, in routine testing, and they uh, can die from an abnormal heart rhythm, which occurs in this condition. So um, I think that the one thing that you can do is that all young adults should have at least one electrocardiogram uh, at, at some time when they're being examined, uh, and this will be a clue to, to that happening. Uh, certainly, if you're going to be going out for athletic kind of pursuits, uh, there are testing. There is testing that's being done, including echocardiogram and, and X-rays and things like that, that will determine and will find these kinds of problems, which again will cause uh, exacerbate uh, athletic prowess or athletic activity will cause the tendency for arrhythmias to occur, for, for abnormal heart rhythms to occur if you have this condition. And let me thank Stefan for the question. Um, women are more difficult to diagnose and they have different kind of symptoms and uh, there's a whole difference in terms of treating women, cardio? They do to a certain extent and that probably has to do with the size of their arteries and with other, other factors. Um, unfortunately, many of the early studies with coronary artery disease were done with men only or high percentages of men. So a lot of the symptoms are more um, pointed, more, more pointed towards men than women. But you have to be um, alert to any of these kinds of possibilities that people have that could point to heart disease. And it is not just simply chest pain. There could be arm pain, there could be jaw pain, uh, there could be back pain. Uh, there could be abdominal discomfort, and all of these things could be clues. So uh, the doctor has to listen. Uh, the patient has to be sensitive enough to realize when they're not feeling well 
uh, to seek medical advice. And in those circumstances, a good outcome will usually occur. Most people, if they have abdominal pain, though, they're not thinking they're having a heart attack, right? I mean, they have to get checked out for cardiac problem. That's true. But any but, but a, a careful physician will be aware of this situation and will evaluate a patient as a whole person, not just think about their stomach or their heart or their brain or their, their extremities, but will actually look at the whole person and say, well, what is causing this? And a, a good clinician will be able to determine what the problem is. And another good question from Robert down in Los Angeles. He wants to know, can hardening of the arteries be reversed? And if so, how is this accomplished? Which brings up Dean Ornish, I think, doesn't he? Yes. Yes. As a matter of fact, uh, Dean Ornish was a, uh, a pioneer in reversing hardening of the arteries. And he did it with a very stringent diet. Uh, we can do this to a certain extent now with statins and with some other medications that are more potent than statins even. Uh, and uh, this is important. Um, what's most important is preventing progression. Uh, reversing is not that important. Uh, what's important is preventing progression. Uh, if an individual presents with a certain degree of hardening of the arteries, uh, this can be managed and managed well, and people can live for years and years without having an actual cardiac event. Uh, and if someone has a cardiac event, that's very treatable nowadays. And uh, again, if you get an individual who's had a cardiac event and stabilizes, his condition can be managed without necessarily reversing hardening of the arteries, but with stabilizing it. And that's really our goal. Reversal, yes, very good, but not as, not as, as easily achieved as uh, stabilization. Well, in your field, in, in cardiology in general, you have specializations and subspecializations. And uh, I wonder how it is that, uh, I mean, you get a ranking like one of the top doctors in America. How is it that people can find the best doctors, particularly when they're looking for something very subspecialized? Yeah. Well, I, I think part of that issue is being in a community where there's good medical care from the ground up. Uh, if you have good primary care physicians, uh, you're going to have these primary care physicians associating with good specialists and communities. We're very fortunate, for example, in Marin County that we have, it, it's a relatively small community and yet we have very high level of medical care uh, because there are good people practicing medicine here, uh, because we're close to a university medical center uh, and we have uh, really unlimited resources for providing good medical care uh, within a 50-mile radius of where we are. Oh boy, if you're out in the sticks, there's big problems often. Well, it can be. Yeah. It can be. Yeah. Uh, you've got to you know, do more on your own and take better care of yourself if you're living in, in a, a very rural area. Um, but these, again, I mean, it, with modern transportation and with modern uh, modes of communication like Zoom, et cetera, uh, even living out in rural areas, if you're properly cared for and you properly take care of yourself, uh, you can get as good medical care practically as you could in even in, in as, as you could in Marin County. Another good question from Juan in Mexico City: How beneficial is the ingest ingestion of supplements to prevent heart disease? Um, well, there's not a lot of data on on that in terms of proving that these supplements are beneficial. Um, some may be, we just don't know. I think they haven't been studied to a great enough extent uh, to know if they're going to be beneficial. Uh, so I think we're stuck with doing the natural kinds of things, eating a good diet, exercising regularly, uh, getting enough rest, and trying to avoid stress as much as possible, uh, and taking medications that you need and, and that are required for, for your condition. And there, I wanted to ask you about some newer medications for congestive heart failure. Can you enlighten us on that? Yes. Uh, congestive heart failure is a, a very interesting field. It's, um, it's, it's on the, undergoing a lot of positive uh, effects lately. Uh, there was a time uh, not too many years ago when all we had available was was diuretics, which are water pills which drain water from your system, uh, and digoxin, um, which is digitalis, uh, which is an old medication which goes back to the 18th century. Um, and those were sort of the only medications we had for treating it. Uh, over the last 40 to 50 years, there have been waves of, of changes in treatment. And we now have a whole list of medications that are useful. Um, there are uh, these uh, ACE inhibitors, the angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors. There are angiotensin receptor blockers. There are combination medications. There's even recently been uh, shown to be effective a medication for diabetes 
that was, was noted to, to be improve people who had diabetes and heart failure and is now being used routinely in treating congestive heart failure. So there's been a, a tremendous revolution over the last number of years in the medical treatment of congestive heart failure, which is very positive for people who previously could become cripples and remain cripples with this condition. But heart disease is still the biggest killer. I mean, more than cancer, more than really anything. Well, apparently, yes. And I think part of that is that, uh, number one, people are not attentive enough to get to a doctor on time. Uh, and number two is that eventually, if we live long enough, most of us are going to have the uh, degenerative heart disease that, or the degenerative vascular disease that we get. Uh, this is one of the reasons that, that we eventually wear out our bodies is because of vascular disease, uh, blood vessel disease. Uh, and this is, happens in the brain, it happens in the heart, uh, and uh, there's not a lot we can do about that other than to, again, as we're young people, as we start out in this game, take care of ourselves. Oh, come on, we can reverse the enzyme process, we all this biotechnology, right? We can live forever. <laughs> well, it may happen, but it I'm hasn't joking. happened yet. It's not <laughs> and then, I don't think it'd necessarily be a good thing if and when it does, but that's another yes. point. Uh, Robert from Los Angeles, what are some common public misunderstandings about maintaining heart health? Well, again, as we mentioned before, uh, taking supplements. Uh, just thinking that you're going to take a supplement or take some kind of a pill that's going to make you healthy uh, is, not, is not the answer. Um, you know, avoiding, I mean, taking, not only that, but taking things, for example, like thinking that caffeine is going to help you, thinking that alcohol is going to help you. A lot of it has to do with, with um, ingesting things that really are not going to help. Uh, and I think those are some of the public uh, misconceptions that, that we're up against. And a question uh, from Chad in Columbia, Missouri. I had labs done that resulted in my doctor prescribing meds for elevated triglycerides. I asked to repeat labs with fasting and lost 200 points for a normal level. How often are people prescribed unneeded medications and how dangerous can they be? Well, they can be, uh, and you have to be careful. Um, medication for triglyceride um, may be useful, but probably for triglycerides specifically, uh, diet is a very important uh, aspect of that. And here, alcohol, sugar, uh, and um, uh, are very important uh, factors that increase triglycerides and therefore have to be cut down significantly. Um, again, people aren't necessarily going to do that, so they'll end up taking medication. But most of the medications that are prescribed by doctors for the right reasons, are not toxic. Uh, they've been tested. Uh, whatever you think of the FDA, they've done a good job of, of uh, clearing a lot of the medications that we use in everyday practice. Uh, and uh, I think that there aren't... It, it, the, the problem is, is not really that there are so many medications that are potentially toxic, but that not enough people get the right medications at the right time. And you had mentioned atrial fibrillation before. This is pretty common, especially among the elderly, isn't it? Yes. Um, atrial fibrillation has become a very common issue. Uh, it was 20, 25 years ago, it was uh, not recognized as being all that important because there wasn't that much we could do about it. Uh, but now we know a lot more about it. Uh, it's also become more common as the population ages. Uh, it's very common in people over the age of 70 and even more common in people over the age of 80 uh, and is um, increasing in, in prevalence as the, as the population ages. Now, there are numerous treatments for that. There's um, one of the treatments that originally has been, been present is just controlling the rate. One of the issues with atrial fibrillation is that the heart rate can be very high. And because of that, people can be very uncomfortable and not function well. So the first step is controlling the heart rate. Uh, controlling the rhythm with medication has been going on for a long time, and there are many medications available. More recently, we've come to a time when cardiac ablation is used. This is a procedure which zaps the area that is causing the atrial fibrillation and restores the heart to normal rhythm. So there are many treatments now for atrial fibrillation. And here again, you need to, to, to go through your primary care doctor, get to the right cardiologist. And here, one of the subspecialties in cardiology, something called electrophysiology, is extremely important because these are the people the electrophysiologists who control and maintain atrial fibrillation. And I thought, um, we'll get to some more questions in just a moment, but I was uh, made aware of the fact that February is American Heart Month, American Heart Association 
makes people more aware, like you're doing, about yes. how to do better care for your heart. Great public service. Uh, thank you again for this. Um, it's also Valentine's uh, Day in February, and so you can actually die of a broken heart, can't you? Yes, there is a condition called broken heart syndrome, which uh, in, in which an acute stress can cause a heart attack. Uh, and this happens, uh, the exact mechanism is not always the same, but it seems to be a spasm in the coronary artery, which mimics blockage of, of a coronary artery by plaque. So an individual can have actually normal coronary arteries, but under the situation of a particular acute extreme stress can develop this situation, can have a heart attack and can die. And emotional stress is certainly a factor here. Uh, for example, uh, I, I had a patient a few years ago who um, a deer ran in front of her car and she suddenly had a tremendous feeling of, of chest pain. She stopped her car in time, but she had a feeling of chest pain and she came in a few days later and she had had a heart attack. Uh, she fortunately didn't die and she got completely better. But these kinds of stresses uh, can do that. A severe emotional stress, uh, hearing about a child's death, that kind of thing, can also do the same thing. We always hear these stories about, you know, a wife dying, long married couple, and then he dies immediately after that, and that sort of thing. Or at the deathbed, somebody dies when the person dies. Uh, I mean, these are anecdotal, I suppose, to some degree, but they do occur. They do. They do. And uh, you mentioned plaque. Could plaque be used to actually project into the future what can happen to your heart? I remember... Years ago, we mentioned, I mentioned Dean Ornish. He said to me, let's look at your plaque. He did a test on me. And uh, he said, you know, this could happen to you and that could happen to you unless you clean yourself up. It right. was very useful yeah. to me. But how much can plaque actually be used for that kind of prognostic? Well, there's a very useful test. Uh, it's called a calcium cardiac calcium screening where uh, a, a rapid CT scan is done of the heart. And it's an inexpensive test. And it's in, in the range of if you have to if you have to pay for it, three or four hundred dollars, and uh, it's a very low radiation exposure, uh, where you can see how much plaque there is in the heart, as reflected by uh, the presence of calcium. So calcium is a marker for plaque, and this test very readily gives you a calcium estimate. Uh, you get a calcium score, and this can tell you about how much plaque you have. It doesn't tell you if you have actual blockage, but it does tell you that you're prone to blockage, and this can be treated. Uh, these are people who should significantly lower their cholesterol uh, and uh, get to a lifestyle that is uh, better than they've been living, uh, and the heart, heart, heart attacks can be prevented. Well, along with the myriad number of questions that are buzzing around my head, I see here's a question from Jessica in Paris, France. It's a question in my mind. How much does sugar in our diet affect our heart? Well, sugar is interesting. Um, sugar doesn't directly affect the heart, but sugar can lead to, number one, weight gain. Number two, the development of diabetes, which um, it, by its nature will then cause uh, heart disease, coronary artery disease, and, and uh, devastation to blood vessels because the presence of sugar uh, has an effect on the blood vessels themselves. So sugar is important. Uh, and um, it's also um, something that is, uh, again, it causes weight gain, which is, which is important, and it does cause all these other problems. So sugar is important. I think we should try to avoid sugar in the pure form. Uh, carbohydrates are certainly important in our diets, and very, we should have adequate carbohydrates. But sugar is, if you ingest sugar directly, your sugar in your blood spikes significantly. That causes you to have an insulin reaction, and this sets in a cascade which over time can be detrimental to your health and your blood vessels. The bottom line is healthy food extends life, as a simple equation would have it. Yeah. It's pretty clear from everything we've seen that that's the case, yes. And uh, here's Shannon, who wants to know, if you have AFib, how important is it to avoid alcohol? Well, it depends. Um, some uh, alcohol acutely can cause atrial fibrillation. Alcohol probably chronically can be instrumental in causing atrial fibrillation. There are some people who have atrial fibrillation unrelated to alcohol, but alcohol can be a trigger, as can caffeine for atrial fibrillation. So alcohol is an important factor uh, in atrial fibrillation uh, and should be discussed with your, with your personal physician in terms of how much you can have, how much you can tolerate, and whether it is a factor in your particular atrial fibrillation. 
Go to another question here. Uh, here's uh, Stefan again from Germany. He wants to know, would you please explain the word statins for a non-native speaker, which was used in one of the beginning questions? Yes. Uh, there's a um, class of medications called uh, statins. This includes uh, a torvastatin, et cetera. This is a um, medication which uh, works on liver to um, reverse the effects of uh, cholesterol. It, it reduces the cholesterol levels uh, in the body in a chemical way. So um, the statins are medications. Um, some of the typical trade names are uh, Lipitor, uh, Crestor, uh, Mevacor, but they're all in the statin class of medications, and they're very important as a first-line treatment of elevated cholesterol. Well, let's talk about lipids uh, for primary and secondary uh, prevention of heart disease. Very important. Yes. Um, so here again, uh, I think that pe secondary prevention implies that you've already had a cardiac event of some kind, whether it's the development of angina or an actual heart attack. Uh, primary prevention is preventing that first heart attack. So here is where we come to measuring lipids, number one. Number two, uh, coronary calcium screening to see if you already have plaque. Uh, and three, recognizing that you've had a, a cardiac condition that's developed already. Now, um, it's important to diagnose elevated cholesterol as early as possible, determine whether plaque is present, and make a determination whether the cholesterol can be controlled with diet and exercise or whether a statin is necessary. Uh, usually, most doctors and most uh, professionals will start out with diet and exercise in order to try to control the cholesterol. Uh, if it's not controlled that way, uh, and or if you have significant plaque on a coronary calcium screening test, then a statin would be important uh, and very important, in fact, in, in preventing the development of heart disease. Uh, and uh, people are concerned that statins can cause muscle problems, can cause liver problems, can cause, as you mentioned, memory, uh, memory problems. Yeah. Uh, the fact of the matter is that, um, in, in fact, some recent, recent studies, many of the people who had um, what they claimed to be muscle problems in a study that was controlled with placebo a bunch of people received placebo, uh, which is a, like a sugar pill, and the other group received statins. There was virtually no difference in the development of uh, muscle problems with these medications. So it turns out that the, the, the problem with muscles with uh, statins are extremely rare, really uncommon, and probably less than 1%. Uh, and um, also, the liver problems are, are very rare. Uh, and um, if you really are... are being properly controlled by your physician, you're taking your statin, these things can be diagnosed before they happen. Uh, if you need to, you can stop a statin if it really is a problem, uh, and there are other medications available. Uh, but most people uh, who don't want to take statins don't want to take them for their own reasons and not because there's anything wrong with the drugs. How long have statins been around, do you know? Now it's been probably 50 years. It's been a half century, that's what yeah. I was thinking, yeah. yeah. Plus you can reduce lipids uh, through... Uh, High fiber food through oatmeal, right? Absolutely, high fiber foods is very important. Uh, and again, if you you know it's a double pronged approach: reduce the saturated fats in your diet, uh, increase the complex carbohydrates or high fiber foods, uh, and these things together will result in most cases in a significant reduction in your cholesterol. We go to another question from Juan in Mexico City. At what age is recommended to start paying more attention to the heart to prevent issues? Well, I mean, think it's, it's actually from birth on, in a sense. Uh, fortunately, yeah, but it goes individual to individual, doesn't it? I mean, yeah, well, yeah. Fortunately, children are very active physically. They do all the right things. Uh, I think it, it has to be people should be kept healthy from the time they're young uh, and, and not to worry about doing anything specific until they're at least teenagers or in their 20s. Uh, a casual cholesterol level should be obtained. Uh, if people are really taking care of themselves, this will not be an issue until much later in life. If there's a family history of coronary disease, especially premature coronary disease, this, this individual should be investigated more thoroughly. But there's no specific age, as, as you point out. It's, it's really an individual thing, um, but you don't need to worry about it probably into your 30s, 40s, or 50s, if you're taking care of yourself. 
Well, taking care of yourself includes exercise, and uh, that seems to be an individual thing, too, to some great degree. I mean, the fact is, I like to walk. Um, I'm told and certainly have read that walking is healthy, and especially if one walks on a regular basis. And yet, I wonder, should I be doing something more intense, more aerobic, more pressure on my cardiovascular system, you know, right. uh, more of a challenge, those kinds of things? I mean, I know it's tailored to the individual, but... What's the, is there a best exercise, an optimal exercise? There's no optimal exercise. It doesn't really matter that much. I think using most of the muscles in your body and using them uh, sometimes vigorously is important. Uh, it's also an age situation. Uh, if you're young and healthy, you can do much more, and you should do much more. Uh, if you're uh, 60, 70, 80, I, I think uh, the amount of, of vigorous exercise is going to naturally be reduced. Uh, stamina is reduced as you get older. Uh, you just can't do the things you could do earlier without hurting yourself. So uh, moderation, again, is, is probably the way to go. Um, young people playing tennis, riding bikes, skiing, whatever, uh, is, is very important, and it's good exercise. Um, it shouldn't be done only on a seasonal basis. You should have a program where you're exercising every week, not necessarily every day, but certainly every week throughout the year, uh, and uh, keeping up with with exercise and keeping your heart rate up, uh, keeping, again, a good diet, uh, you know, keeping your weight down. And, and these are all the important things to keeping yourself healthy. And it's not only, it's not only for heart disease, but also for, for cancer prevention and, and prevention of other diseases as well. There's an old saw that the best exercise is swimming and walking upstairs. I don't know. That's kind of a, maybe a wife's tale or something along those lines. Those are perfectly appropriate. Those are very good exercises. The nice thing about stairs is they're all over. You can always find a place to do it. It's usually not raining when you're walking upstairs. So uh, that's one good exercise. Swimming is good because it uses a lot of muscles in your body. Um, it's any, there's so many good exercises. It's, and I think some people can, can run without any problems. Other people hurts their knees and their hips and that's, so it's not good for them. So it, it's very variable. It's very variable. Speaking about things that are variable, can you maybe help us in terms of detecting the differences? Uh, there's some people, if they're hypochondriacal, they get alarm when they have pain in their chest. It might just be gas pain or something along those lines. Any way to really determine when you're having periodic pain that seems considerable or intense even, that it's not just, you know, from what you've ingested and digested or... You don't know that, and that's why we have medical professionals. I think um, you need to go and see a medical professional. If it's a persistent, severe pain, obviously you need immediate attention, and you might go to an emergency room. If it's a recurrent pain that you're not sure about, you'll call up your primary care provider, whether it's a, and it could be a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant or a primary care provider, uh, a primary care physician. Uh, and be seen, depending on how bad it is and, and, what, and, and what the situation is, be seen as soon as possible. Um, and there are various tests that can be done that will prove whether this is gastrointestinal or cardiac. Uh, and uh, depending on, again, the interpretation by the primary care provider, uh, you may be referred to a specialist, you may be patted on your back and say, don't worry about it. Um, but if you have somebody who's competent, uh, this can be uh, taken care of, and complications can be avoided. Can you induce a heart attack by what you eat? I mean, say you really pig out, or uh, is that a catalyst that can well, actually bring about? Well, it could be. If you're on the brink of having a heart attack because you have a significant blockage in an artery, uh, the um, changes in your metabolism right after a very large meal can possibly precipitate a heart attack. Uh, it's unlikely, but it, it has occurred and can occur. Rare, though. It's pretty rare, yeah. Another question from Germany. Is there a cure for the thick heart wall syndrome that you mentioned before? Well, it, there's no cure for it. There's treatment for it. And the treatment involves medication to relax the heart. It involves medication to try and reduce the problem of abnormal heart rhythms. If abnormal heart rhythms have occurred or, or, or are induced, uh, you may need something like a defibrillator, which is a, a device which actually reverses the arrhythmia when it occurs and prevents death. Uh, and also, if the, if the heart is so thick that it's causing trouble, there's, there's surgical procedures for reducing the thickness of the heart muscle. So none of these things are curative, but this condition can be managed, and people can have a pretty natural uh, long life, even with a thick heart muscle. Boy, I remember when uh, they used to talk about heroic heart transplants. Uh, I always use that word heroic with the bakey and people like that. 
And it, I remember the pioneering stage. We're well we're past that now. I mean, it's almost become uh, de rigueur in some instances to consider heart transplant. Isn't yes. It? I think one of the problems with it, it's, it's very expensive. There aren't that many hearts available, um, but it certainly can be done in heart transplant work. Heart transplants can... And people can have a heart transplant and live for many years after after that. So where do you see, uh, just curious to kind of tap into this in, in your imagination, uh, where do you see this kind of technology going eventually? I mean, in terms of what we're going to be able to do for heart disease. Yeah, well, I think, I think um, mechanical supports, mechanical replacements for the heart uh, are getting better and better and smaller and smaller. And this is also a, um, an important... Uh, factor. Uh, it's been used in the past. These mechanical assist devices have been used as a bridge to transplant, but it's possible that these may be something that we can use permanently, that you can have just like with an artificial kidney, as opposed to a kidney transplant. You can go on for years and years with uh, dialysis with an artificial kidney. Uh, an artificial heart might just do as well. Um, also, at the, the, the using uh, Pig hearts, for example, instead of yeah. human hearts, uh, if the immunology can be worked out well enough, this is also a solution. So yes, there is there is certainly hope in the future for people whose hearts are so badly damaged that they have to be replaced. What else have you seen? I mean, in your years of practicing cardiology, just technically take place that's been especially surprising or unexpected. Well, I think a lot of the, a lot of the uh, we made, we talked about electrophysiology, all of the procedures for uh, changing arrhythmias, for treating arrhythmias, uh, the um, the use of different kinds of devices. Now, for example, you do not need to have an open heart operation to replace a valve. Valves can now be replaced through a catheter, through a tube that goes through one of your arteries to your heart, and the valve can be replaced without opening the chest. Uh, this is very dramatic. Um, there's a condition in atrial fibrillation where situations where some people will have blood clots form. And in fact, most people with atrial fibrillation now need to be on blood thinners. There's a procedure where the area of the heart where this, these clots form can be occluded uh, and the use of anticoagulants or blood thinners is no longer necessary. These are all you know, very dramatic and very important things. Uh, there are certain kinds of pacemakers which are very valuable for congestive heart failure, which resynchronize the heart and make it beat in a fashion that improves the cardiac function. So it's, it's incredible what's gone on over the last 20, 30, 50 years uh, in cardiology to uh, help people uh, who need these kinds of, of devices. Any sense of where it might be going? Well, again, I think um, it's knowing more genetically and getting to the genetic sources of many of these problems. Uh, for example, even just cholesterol and being able to treat on genetic levels uh, and, and treating individuals based on their, their perfectly individual genes. That's in the cards, isn't it? I think so, yeah. yeah. I was also wondering, having practiced cardiology uh, for many years, you're dealing with such intimacy in people's lives. I mean, life and death uh, yes. all the time. Yes. And it must make you reflect to some extent on mortality and just on the life cycles and right. all that you go through in terms of seeing what people endure and what they get through and mm -hmm. survive with and uh, how it affects families and all that. What observations particularly might you offer us? Well, one of the, the things that struck me has struck over the years has, has caused me to reflect a great deal is um, how uh, susceptible people are to different kinds of, of stresses from their physician. That uh, individuals who come to a physician and feel better when they leave the doctor's office seem to have a much more uh, balanced approach to their lives and to their, to their illnesses. And um, I always felt it was very important to have a positive attitude with my patients and to be able to um, express, after giving them all the facts, to be able to tell them that things are not necessarily as bleak as they think they are, because people tend to worry a lot more about their condition than we appreciate. Uh, I think we have to get sick ourselves to appreciate uh, how people feel when they're ill. But you're not feeding them malarkey. I mean, uh, you're no, giving absolutely. them the facts, as you said. Absolutely not. So what do you do when you have someone who's bleak and it's grim? And it's, well, you, know, you have to be honest with them and you have to be honest with their families and you just, you know, want to make it as, as 
as positive as possible. Uh, fortunately, being a cardiologist and being in cardiology, we have so many kinds of treatments for people, and we're very fortunate in that regard, and it's not particularly bleak for cardiology patients. I think this is in, in the uh, context of something that I was trying to get at before, but another question from Robert in Los Angeles about, is the doctor aware of any major breakthroughs on the horizon related to heart health? I mean, I think it's a. It, there are no major breakthroughs in the sense of of dramatic changes. Uh, I think they're all incremental, mostly incremental. And there are people who are sort of chipping away at the few remaining problems we have. Uh, again, I think in cardiology we've been very fortunate uh, in having so many people working so hard to get us solutions to so many problems, and they've done for the most part a very good job. We and need more that, research, though. We need a lot. We need more continuing research, research yeah. sure, and we need continuing studies and and uh, breakthroughs occur, like for example, with the uh, replacing valves through catheters, uh, doing minimizing the necessity for surgery, open heart surgery. Uh, these are all very, very valuable and and very productive. What do you tell people about finding a really qualified or competent or able cardiologist? I mean. Uh, I don't know if there are ratings around or ways of discovering, particularly if you have a specific thing that you need tending to. Right. Well, that's a tough one. I think there, again, it depends on your community, and it, it mostly depends on the primary practitioners in the community. And the, But that, that also has to do with, with how the community treats no, but I mean, are care. there like Yelp ratings or anything like that? Well, I, I don't know. I don't know how good those are. I, I think um, they probably have some positive. I think it's more a question of finding out from your friends, finding out from, from your, again, your primary care providers, uh, knowing your community. Uh, if you're really interested in finding the best, you'll, you'll be able to do it. I don't think it's, it's, a, it's a big secret. There are plenty of good people around, and um, it's, not, it's not problematic to find them. One of the problems now, of course, is is the uh, increasing scarcity of physicians and other providers. Uh, fortunately, I think more uh, nurse practitioners and physicians assistants are being trained to uh, take care of people, especially in primary care, where we have a uh, you know a dearth of of new people coming into primary care in the, as as physicians. But I think um, primary care. Nurse practitioners and physicians' assistants can help here quite a bit. Um, and it's a matter of, of knowing your community, understanding your community, and being in, in touch with the resources that are available. Let me go back to something that you touched on before because it really intrigues me, that idea that you can actually help the health of a patient by having a more sanguine or positive, optimistic attitude and so forth. I mean, there's research that pretty much backs that up. There it? is. There is. But it's also, <clears throat> it's also very gratifying to see the attitude of people change by having a physician who's, who's positive. Um, that, that having negative physicians makes you angry and gets you upset and you feel out of sorts. And that can't be good for you in terms of even just your emotional status. And it's not good for you because then you don't tend to follow that physician's advice. Sometimes aren't negative physicians just kind of covering uh, their behinds in terms of ensuring that no litigation comes out or something along those lines? They could. I think I don't think that's that really a major problem. I think that has to do with the, the attitude and the personality of a physician. And it's important to find someone who you're compatible with as your physician, whether it's a specialist or a primary care physician, probably especially with a primary care physician. It's very important to have someone who you can communicate with and feel good about, because if you feel good about it, you're going to feel good about your medical care, and you're going to listen to your doctor, you're going to follow his advice or her advice, uh, and you're going to do better in the long run. How much can you depend, really, on your primary physician to detect problems related to the heart, which often go to specialists? Uh, I mean, I'm talking about detecting, not treating necessarily. I mean, right. because many primary physicians will say, look, I'm going to refer you to a specialist because I think there's something in your heart that needs to be looked at or needs to be tended to. But the reality is that uh, in some cases, a lot of cases, those things are missed by primary physicians. That's true. So they, there again, you need to have an attentive primary care physician and, and an attentive individual who listens to you. Um, here again, I think we're living in an environment where physicians are, are so busy that it's, it could be problematic. And I think this, again, is where having physicians' assistants and, and nurse practitioners take a primary care role 
uh, will be useful over the years and has been useful. Um, and these people are well-trained generally. They usually have more time for you. And one of the most important things is not how smart you are as a, as a practitioner, but how much you're going to listen to your patient and use whatever skills you have to try and determine what's wrong. I think the most important thing is for an individual in the, at the primary care level is to know their limitations. And if they're smart people and they know their limitations, they'll know when they need to refer. They'll know how to make diagnoses at the primary level uh, and be able to, to take care of any problem that comes along with the aid of, of, of consultants. Well, more and more is uh, on the shoulders of the nurses, uh, I think it's fair to say, particularly in terms of determining what the problem is. I mean, it often begins with the nurse, and then it goes from that point forward. Nurses used to be seen as kind of the handmaidens to physicians, and now they're playing a much more instrumental role. A good well, thing? yeah. I mean, they're medical professionals, and they're well-trained, and now they're, they're, they have access to, to much more information than they had over the years, and they're being treated very positively. A lot of systems have uh, nurses as advice individual. So if you make a phone call, the first person you're going to speak to is an individual who is an advice nurse who is very competent in terms of understanding what symptoms people have and can then decide whether it's something that, that he or she can handle or whether there's a referral necessary to a physician or a physician's assistant uh, and on up the chain to, to getting to the right specialist to take care of the right problem. How well do you think public health information is going out to the public? Well, probably not as well as it should, uh, but you know, it's we live in in such a crazy time where there's so much disinformation, uh, not only in medicine but in, in in politics and in in economics and whatever that we really have to be careful uh, about what's going what's going on. Uh, people don't trust the FDA. People don't trust the CDC. People don't trust the FBI. I mean, it's 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 really. Um, but they trust information that comes across on the internet a lot of times. Right. They they trust they often trust misinformation. So I don't know whose fault it is or, or, or who can answer who, who can solve the problem, but um, it would be very nice to have information that you can trust from whatever source. Any ideas about how that might be brought into fruition in some fashion? I I really don't. I mean that's that's really a sort of a political question. It's out of question, your right? uh, out of your realm. I didn't mean to necessarily <laughs> suggest that uh, your practice would give you that kind of insight, but it's something that I struggle with and constantly try to reflect on how to better educate the public and make the public more aware. And again, it's not in my bailiwick necessarily, but something certainly I think about. Um, let's let's go back to food for a moment though, um, because uh, for example, as I mentioned apples and bananas before. Those are actually uh, supposed to be helpful for heart blockage. Why is that? Again, it's it's simply because they can potentially lower cholesterol by um, by absorbing cholesterol in the gut. There's there's certainly fiber. I don't know specifically about apples and bananas, but uh, again, if you're eating an apple and banana instead of a of a hamburger uh, and a cheeseburger and you know and a, and a cheese sandwich or a grilled cheese sandwich, then you're better off then you're much more likely to, to control plaque. This, this gets into um, very serious existential questions for many people, <laughs> like <laughs> moi. Uh, I mean, deciding between, say, the healthy food or as opposed to a good cheeseburger. Uh, any hints in terms of how you well, think? Well, you know, I think it, it's, it, this is a philosophical problem of the fact that, well, this cheeseburger that I eat today is not going to hurt me. And, and that's probably true. So it's really taking the long view and doing the right thing most of the time, if not all of the time, that, that really makes a difference. I mean, we're, we're very, you know, strange in that sense that we, we can adapt very easily to, to the moment, um, but, don't, but have difficulty living uh, in the um, projected future. So it's, it's, I, don't know, I don't have the answer to that. All I can give is advice about what you should do. Don't eat the cheeseburger. <laughs> Don't eat the cheeseburger, right? Yeah, well, and then you get the feeling that, boy, this is something that I really want, the cheeseburger. I have a yen for it. Uh, and um, nah, apples and bananas are not going to do it. I'll tell you what else um, I've, I've been looking into. I mean, there's a whole science, obviously, of food and the effect on the heart. Juices are good. Like pomegranate juice is good and green juice is good. Well, uh, again, I mean, juices are not uh, – probably you should stick with the whole fruit – and not the juice. So if pomegranate juice is good, you should be eating pomegranates. 
um, whatever you, you're talking about, because juices are usually just an extract. They have no fiber in them at all. And it's just a, basically like a chemical, usually sugar added. So I'm not, I'm not a big fan of juices per se. Well, the problem is that there are so many things that should be healthy, but are, uh, shall we say, um, played with or toyed with altered. by the manufacturer. <laughs> yeah, altered. I mean, uh, in ways that are um, in almost uh, inviolable. Um, I'm also thinking about the fact that, um, I mean, look, food labeling is important and you can tell what's on what you're buying as a consumer and so forth. But you're also for, I'm wondering, for example, when I'm taking sugarless food because I'm diabetic, what about the other chemicals that are in there? They may be just as harmful as the sugar to me. Right, right. I think Michael Pollan said that if there are more than four ingredients in what you're, you're going to eat or ingest that you probably shouldn't ingest it. <laughs> um, it's, it's, uh, I think also anything that has ingredients on the label, you have to stop and say, wait a minute, why shouldn't I be going to the produce department and getting the real food or going to whichever department and getting the food itself rather than some kind of altered and prepared food? We're talking about food and exercise and, you know, getting your blood sugar checked, uh, getting your heart uh, pressure checked, all those kinds of things. What about the air we breathe? What about the environment and how it affects the heart? I mean, well, there is an ecology effect on the heart, isn't yeah, there? Yeah, that's, that's, that's somewhat important. I think if you're living in, in pollution, uh, you're, you can be in trouble. Uh, fresh air is very important. Um, you know, this is part of, you know, climate change, ecology, and you know, all these things, which we don't individually necessarily have control over. Um, if you live in a certain area and you have to deal with the air that, that you breathe, you don't have any control over that really. Uh, you can have filters in your house, things of that sort, but uh, I think that, that involves the political structure. It involves um, you know, industry and all of these things to, to get, get rid of the pollution because pollution can, can be a problem. If there's not enough oxygen, if there are pollutants in the air that can affect your body, uh, they need to be reduced. And let's talk just for a moment again about stress. Best ways to reduce stress, exercise? It's one of the ways, uh, exercise, uh, you know, being meditation, um, any kind of, of, I mean, there's so many ways to reduce stress. Um, so in some cases, medication may be important, but um, generally if you um, have a balanced diet, balanced uh, amount of rest, um, but, you know, there are external stresses that we necessarily can't control. You know, we live with people who get, cause stress. We, we uh, have jobs that cause stress. And we have to sort of maximize what we do to, to reduce that, whether it's by having a counselor or, again, sometimes by taking medication, uh, by using exercise as a release, by, having, by using meditation, by reading a book in a quiet place. Uh, these are all things that we, that we need to do and have to think about, um, but are not necessarily easy to control. One other thing we can control that I really want to touch upon, which is much more important than most people realize, sleep. Yes. Oh, there's no question that sleep is a very important factor. One of the problems with sleep is, well, more than one, one problem. People are so busy that they don't get a chance to sleep. Uh, people uh, drink alcohol, which uh, affects their sleep. People take drugs, which, which can affect their sleep both positively and negatively. There's also a kind of cultural thing. I sleep less, and that's somehow competitive, you know, that I'm... Uh, I'm a work machine because I only sleep three hours a night, you know, and that kind of feeling. Well, that's unfortunate because most of us need somewhere between six and a half and eight and a half hours of sleep. And uh, if we get any less than that, we're not functioning as well as we should. And the body is not healing itself, repairing itself the way it should, which is what sleep is. It's affecting is your heart if you're not sleeping enough. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So uh, your recommendation is about six hours a night for most adults? Oh, no, at adults? least. Uh, probably at more, least. Like, more like a minimum of probably six and a half, which some people can get away with, but probably seven to eight hours of sleep. What about if you're getting up in the middle of the night and stuff? You're not getting you know, that rim kind of sleep that well, you need. Well, that's a problem, which is, you know, I think people who have that, if they're, if they're young people... Uh, and they're working, it's a problem. If you're retired, you can get away with it, um, which fortunately, for example, with uh, a, a, an abnormal prostate, which older people might have, uh, which gets them up several times at night. At least they can sleep later in the morning to, to catch up with the sleep. They can take a nap in the afternoon. Uh, these are all things that, that get around that. But yes, it's not, it, there's no question that it's not good to be waking up several times at night. 
Well, I think and hope that this conversation has awakened a lot of people to the importance of taking care of your heart and all the different ways that you can ensure that it will keep on ticking and beating. And uh, you hope that uh, it will serve you and last for a long time as a healthy heart. Thank you, Kent Gershengorn, the MD. Thank you, Michael. And thanks to all of you who joined us for today's episode. You can find out more about Gray Matter with Michael Krasny by going to graymatter.show. And please tell all those you know who want a quality regular podcast with a great range of deep dives and first-rate guests that they should look into joining us as well. We're a growing community, well worth becoming a part of, and we welcome new members. Thanks to the Gray Matter with Michael Krasny team, Alex, Shannon, Colin, Chad, and Kevin. And a special thanks to this week's special guest, our 22nd episode guest, Dr. Ken Kirschengorn. I'm Michael Krasny. Bandwidth for Gray Matter is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com.